beautiful way, which I'll, I'll be mentioning many of these things in more depth later on in this retreat. But years ago, I recognized that there were two parts to the mind. And of course, this is uh, taught by the Buddha, the two types, the, what he called vijnana, the consciousness, and the sankhara, which is the, the doing, the active part of the mind. So half of your mind is very active, planning, wanting, doing, thinking, initiating reactions. That's the active part of the mind. And the other half of the mind is a passive mind, it just knows. It can hear my voice, it can see, it can feel the body, it can even know the thoughts, it's a passive part, which just <coughs> receives the information. What I call, for want of a better word, the knower. And the active mind I call the doer. And when you notice those two halves of the mind, you probably will recognize that most of the mental energy is used up by the doing mind. Always active, always thinking, always going somewhere, always something more to do, always consumed by so much business. So much so, there's hardly any energy left for the knower. The first part of the energy always gets taken by this doing mind. So much so that the knowing mind, consciousness, or if you want a better word for it, mindfulness, has got such a weak amount of energy, which means it's very dull. So a lot of times people think they're aware, but they're not, they're living in a cloud. It's not enough power to it. Just like those old flashlights I used to have years ago in Thailand. The batteries were so dead, you could hardly see with them. And when you get, <coughs> you're lucky enough to get a new pair of batteries, it's amazing just how bright that flashlight could be. Just like most people's minds. The batteries inside your mind are so dead, simply because you've been doing so much, you're worn out. But the mindfulness is very weak. But what happens in meditation? We don't encourage the doing mind. We just let things be. We don't react. We don't want, we don't crave. And after a while, the energy starts to come back into mindfulness. Remember, the energy can go two ways. It can go in reacting, doing, thinking, struggling, striving, or it can just go in just being aware without reacting. <coughs> and after a while of doing letting go, just allowing things to be, you'll find that the mindfulness starts to get more energy. You literally wake up. You get more aware. You know the word, the Buddha, what it really means, it's not the enlightened one. As every one who knows Pali recognizes, the word Buddha means the awakened one. It's a very beautiful word, awakened. Basically, you've woken up. The mindfulness is strong enough, powerful enough, energized enough to see deeply into things. To understand what I mean, there's another simile which I like giving at the beginning of a retreat, because again, it gives you a very clear understanding of what I'm talking about, how important stillness is to be able to see deeply, to see clearly. It's a famous simile of mine because you know, it was from a personal experience of living up here. <coughs> For those of you who don't know, this is our retreat centre. And just you know, if you go outside of the gate of this retreat centre, 500 metres, uh, you find the gate of our monastery on the opposite side of the road. So I've been living in that monastery for about 28 years now. 28 years? Yeah, I think that's about right. 28 years. Uh, we started that monastery. And for the first about seven or eight years, every time I went up and down the hill, down to the main road at the bottom of the hill, it was always in a vehicle. But it happened one day, it was a beautiful spring morning. And that particular morning, it was a sunny day, I had plenty of time. And so I decided to get out of the car and walk up that hillside. It was the first time in seven years of living here, I walked up the hill instead of being driven in a car. 
And as I was walking, it was a very strange experience because I could not recognize my surroundings. It was as if I was walking up that hillside for the very first time in my life. And that surprised me because it was seven years I've been living here. And I started seeing things I'd never noticed before. Rocks and trees and the little river in the valley. I wondered why had I not noticed that before. Seven years and I hadn't seen it. And then I stopped. I stopped, stood perfectly still and stared. And as I stared, the scenery changed again. I could see more than I'd ever expected to see. The lichen on the rocks. <coughs> the little flowers poking up amongst the grass. Little details which I'd missed before. And one of the most surprising things of this experience, that what I see became ever more beautiful. It was delightful, even the colours. You know, just the ordinary grass, the green of the grass, was so many different shades of green. There was some of it was brilliant. And the whole thing looked so delightful. I stood and stared for like, maybe four or five minutes, just enjoying the scenery. But then I thought, why hadn't I noticed this before? Why had it taken me seven years to notice the beauty of that hillside? So, <coughs> as a monk, one of the advantages of being a monk, you have time. Time to contemplate these things, to work it out. You're not so busy. So I walked up the hill and I started contemplating what had gone on. And of course, it's a very simple explanation, but the explanation really gave a wonderful simile of what meditation is all about. The explanation is just basic biology. That when you look at an object, the light hits the back of your eye, the retina, it's a chemical reaction. The problem is, if you look through the window of a car, which is speeding, one image forms on the back of your eye, but it doesn't fully form. Because another image comes up, dislodges the first, and another image, and a third image, a fourth image, a fifth image. The images come so fast that no one is fully formed. And the detail is just smudged out. Just like those days, I remember at school, you <coughs> we would develop our own photographs in the science lesson. If any of you have ever developed a photograph, you know, you see the photographic paper, and you see as a chemical reaction happens, the image you know, appears out of that piece of photographic paper. It takes a while. First there's little shapes, and then you can work out sort of figures, and the colours become richer and richer as the chemical reaction sort of proceeds. You have to wait for, I don't know, a couple of minutes, three or four minutes sometimes, for the reaction to fully complete, so the colours are fully formed. And that's very similar, <coughs> similar to what happens in your eye. So what was happening? Looking through the window of a car, even the colours weren't fully formed. They were washed out, pastel colours. But when I got out of the car and walked, my eye had more time to see. So not only did I see more detail, but the colours were richer. But when I stopped and stood perfectly still, only then could the image fully form. And you could see what was really out there. And not only that, the colours had time to really um, be full and rich. And that's why, standing still, you could actually see so much beauty in that hillside. And the colours were really rich and deep. The uh, texture was there, the detail was there, it was delightful. And I realise that's so similar to the way we live our lives. Most of you live life as if looking through the window of a speeding car. We go so fast in our life. And we think we understand what's beyond that window. You know, the people we live with, you know, the life, even the street in which you live. If you haven't done this yet, I challenge you, when you go back home, walk to the end of the corner of your street. You may be like me, many years you've always gone up and down that street in the car. Walk along the street where you live and you'll notice things which you've never seen before. And it's quite staggering how much you've missed. 
even in the street where you live. And you can imagine in this body and mind in which you live how much you haven't seen because you've been going so fast. So here we slow down. We even maybe get perfectly still. <coughs> and then your mind, all your senses have the chance to fully feel and see what's really here. That's where things not only get deep, you have more insight, more powerful sensory impressions, but also it becomes very beautiful. This was one of the unexpected benefits, to me anyway, of meditation. It's not just you know, philosophizing and <coughs> getting great insights, it's also sheer happiness as well. Life becomes more beautiful when you slow down you get more happiness. And at first I didn't realize what that was really all about until I go back to that simile of the, the doer and the knower. Because you do so much, you run so fast, you think so much, because of that our poor old mind gets, gets tired. So the mindfulness is very weak. But stopping, slowing down, Mindfulness gets more power, you wake up, and that mental energy is happiness. That's what it is. And many people know this. You get up in the morning, and you're not worth talking to until you've had your first cup of coffee. Some people are like that, they're so grumpy and angry. Give them a cup of coffee, and they're happy. Why is that? All that is, is a cup of coffee or a cup of tea is giving you a boost of energy. And when you're energized, you feel much happier. This is actually part of the nature of the brain. One of the reasons people are depressed and angry is because they're tired out. They're so frustrated, they've been struggling so hard in life, they've got no energy left. One of the reasons why people aren't happy. Why they get grumpy, angry, depressed or whatever. <coughs> so, Learn how to slow down and stop. Your mindfulness gets more powerful and you also get more happy. And that's important for me.